I'm going to catch up with the ACT Party leader, David Seymour. Gosh, there's a lot that's been going on, and I don't think we've spoken for quite some time. Hello, David. Hey, Leah, how are you? I am good. It's been it's been a long time between drinks, I think. So it's good. To yeah, talk. yeah, I thought you'd gone off me. <laughs> Well, never. Um, by the way, happy birthday for the other day. I saw on um, social media the team uh, surprising you with a birthday cake, a beehive cake. Interesting. Grey in colour. Yeah, yeah, that was a bit, bit embarrassing. i got to say, sort of got, I feel like I'm starting to understand uh, the, the stage of life being not so keen on your birthday anymore. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I know that birthday, yeah. Well, look, for happy birthday anyway for the other day. Look, let's just, let's just jump into a few things, David, because, my gosh, um, you know, the government's been busy, you've been busy, the party's been busy. Let's start with the fantastic news earlier this week with the announcement the coalition government confirmed $604 million over four years in extra Pharmac funding. It'll cover up to 54 new medicines, including 26 cancer treatments. Now, as Associate Health Minister David... Tell us about the significance of this, especially concerning more effective treatments and now being accessible. Um, well, I think the starting point is New Zealand for a long time has underinvested in pharmaceuticals. Uh, there's no question about this. The, the amount that, that New Zealand spends is much smaller than other countries. And then people say, well, yeah, but we're poor. And that's true. Hmm. Um, but the uh, amount of our health budget that we spend is a, a small, we spend less of our health budget on medicines than basically any other developed country. So we've been pretty tough on pharmaceuticals and it probably has left us worse off because often um, spending more on medicines can, can actually uh, stop people having to go into hospital, stop them hmm. having a transplant in some cases. Uh, for example, I was told that uh, since Trikafta was funded for people with cystic fibrosis, um, the number of lung transplants being done for people with cystic fibrosis has just fallen off a cliff. Um, wow. So, you know, sometimes spending more on medicines can actually save your money elsewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, that's sort of the big picture here. Um, you know, we, we, what we've done uh, this week... Is, you know, the National Party had this promise to do 13 cancer drugs. A bit of a problem there in that we can't tell Pharmac which things to spend. Yeah. Um, so what we've really arrived at is uh, we're going to give them a sufficient amount of money that they're actually going to fund an estimated 26 extra cancer drugs, 54 extra medicines in total, uh, and that's going to include most likely uh, the ones the National Party was talking about. So mm. we actually ended up with a deal that, that preserves Pharmac's independence. They're making the decisions, um, but the, the government has, has decided to give them uh, sufficient money to make sure that a whole lot more people uh, will benefit. And it won't just be you know people with cancer. It's obviously important, but a whole lot of different uh, conditions that sometimes get forgotten. And, I think that's one reason why the Pharmac model is important. Um, it's not just the things that lead the news that get funded. It's the things that they have calculated will alleviate suffering and extend people's lives. Yeah. I heard um, Sarah Fitz, uh, Pharmac's chief executive, saying that they would start immediately to deliver the additional medicines. Dr Shane Rete said the earliest delivery on some of the drugs would be October, November. Is that time frame still correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I can understand people saying, well, you've got the money, won't you buy them? Um, yeah. <laughs> a few things. One is that they they have what they call the options for investment list, which is the list of things they've calculated would have the greatest benefit to patients um, if they had extra money. So in that sense, they're ready to go. Uh, but they also have to do negotiations. And sometimes mm -hmm. uh, if they can get a good price on something and it, it's more uh, cost efficient, uh, then actually it'll go up the list. So... They've got to do a bit of negotiating. Uh, they also obviously got to get the stuff in. And then yeah. uh, some of it is, is stuff that you take orally, so it really is just a tablet. But uh, a lot of the sophisticated treatments uh, now um, are actually quite complicated and that you actually have to go to a hospital and have them administered by a health professional. Mm. Uh, so, you know, in cases like that, it takes a little bit longer. And, you know, you, you said $604 million for pharmaceuticals, and you're right. Um, but the total amount is actually 825 million, um, and that concludes 
uh, a couple of million a year for Pharmax administration because we've actually got to get some bright people to um, calculate the benefits and do the negotiation with the drug companies. Um, okay. But it also includes uh, about 200 million over four years, so about 50 million a year that will go to um, the, uh, the the hospitals uh, who have to do the administration. Um, so you know, partly it's about buying the stuff; it's partly about administering it. And the, the more complicated it is to administer, the longer it will take. So I know I'm going on a bit, but yeah, there's no, quite no, a bit that's to good. It. That, that's good to hear because I did hear an oncologist saying it was fantastic news, but then you know they were worried that there wasn't going to be enough staff to administer it. So um, no, that is good to know. You know, they've got to look on the up, and you've 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 seen that problem, and. Um, and hopefully it will. It, we won't have a big problem with it. Um, can we jump into another space here, David? Um, the second phase of the Royal Commission of Inquiry into COVID-19, Internal Affairs Minister Brooke Van Velden has been leading the process for expanding the inquiry's scope. Uh, what additional matters will it include? Um, so it's going to include uh, looking into uh, things like what was the effect on business, on school, on um, the you know social cohesion, the the division that was created, the amount of money that was uh, borrowed, it, it's really going where Labor uh, refused to go when they did the original commission. Um, Labor were very interested in how effective was uh, the policies they put in place at uh, you know reducing the virus and reducing uh, deaths and illnesses from the virus, and that that's obviously very important. But it's only half the story uh, because you can run a very successful response to the virus but destroy the society. And one thing we've got to consider is I talk to teachers now in my education role uh, mm. and they'll talk about students who are currently in you know, seventh form or year 13. Uh, well, they were in fourth form or year 10 uh, during the initial lockdowns and those students are still, you know, pretty out of sorts and there's evidence that, you know, when there's a disaster, an earthquake or a pandemic or a government lockdown or whatever, um, you know, it actually can take several years for the emotional distress that, that people experience to filter through. Certainly, um, you know, in the wake of the Canterbury quakes, people said things like that. Uh, so, you know, we got to start you know, not just saying, well, were they effective at stopping the virus? And, and mm. in some ways, they were quite effective at that. But what was the cost? You know, not just yeah. the financial cost, but all of the costs. Yeah. Can I bring up uh, Winston Peters, who says he agrees with the need for the second phase, but disagrees to allow the initial inquiry to complete its work? Why is that? Well, it's not really clear, um, you know, what exactly, I mean, you know, everyone knows that there's big problems with the Royal Commission. Um, you know, we said that, that's why we campaigned to, to do what's happened. I mean, X policy was to consult the public, ask what the terms of reference should be, uh, and then put the public's terms of reference in uh, and carry on, which is effectively uh, what we're doing. Um, that means we're going to get new commissioners. Uh, that means we're going to expand the terms of reference, ask the questions we just talked about. Mm. Um, so, you know, everything that Winston would like us to do, uh, we are doing. Um, the, the, the area where he said, well, why don't you cancel the existing one completely? And I just think, well, you know, we spent millions of dollars. We spent a year and a half on it. They've asked a lot of people. Um, we know who did it. We know that they may not be the most objective people. We, we know all that. Um, yeah. But why would you throw away good work? Um, and the second point is, and, and this is really important, um, we, we were never going to um, cancel the Royal Commission because if one government can appoint one and then an incoming mm. government can just uh, slam it, well, that, that's a, or cancel it, that, that's a terrible uh, precedent. So mm. what Pok van Velden's done, you know, she's actually most got everything that, that he campaigned on, um, but so has ACT. Uh, and we've kept the Royal Commission uh, going, but adjusted it so the real questions get asked. Um, so we've kept that, that institution intact. Uh, and we've also done it within a top, pretty tight budget. So I would say that, that Brooke Van Belden, obviously I'm a bit biased to Brooke. <laughs> I think she's done an outstanding job of managing the politics to get the right outcome. Um, and, and actually satisfied all of the coalition agreements, done what ACT campaigned on, done what New Zealand First campaigned on, 
save money, preserve the institution of the Royal Commission, um, and it's not really obvious uh, why you'd be upset about that.